Lowe's has you covered for all those projects on your summer to-do list and will even help you save. Give your home a whole new look inside and out with $10 to $40 off paint, exterior stains, and resurfacers via rebate. And add a pop of color to your porch or patio with flowers. Get your choice two for $10 basic one and a half gallon hanging baskets. All projects have a starting point. Start with Lowe's. Paint offer valid 621 through 75. Exclusions apply. Plan offer valid 628 through 75. Color and selection vary by location while supplies last U.S. only. Hello, it's Tuesday, June 27th, 2017. You are listening to Inception Radio Network, voice of the fringe majority. This is Carol Carl with UFO Headline News. Here's the scoop for what's up today and tonight. According to earthsky.org, the latest sunsets follow summer solstice. For you guys living around 40 degrees north latitude, the latest sunsets of the year happen in late June. And in the southern hemisphere, at 40 degrees south latitude, it's the latest sunrises that happen about this time of year. And that's in spite of the fact that the northern hemisphere's longest, southern hemisphere's shortest day of the year, fell about a week ago on the June solstice. The year's latest sunset always comes after the summer solstice, even though the exact date of the latest sunset depends on your latitude. The farther north, say Seattle, Washington, the latest sunset happens a few days before June 27th. Farther south, Mexico City, Mexico, the latest sunset won't happen till early July. And if you want to know the date of your earliest sunset, well, there's a customized sunrise sunset calendar. You can find that later with a link at UFO Headline News. The latest sunsets come after the summer solstice because that day is more than 24 hours long at that time of the year. In June and July, the day, as measured by successive returns of the midday sun, Well, that's nearly one quarter minute longer than 24 hours. Oh, whatever shall we do with that time? Hence, the midday sun, the solar noon, comes later by the clock in late June than it does on the June solstice itself. Therefore, the sun and sunset times also come later by the clock. If the Earth's axis stood upright as our world circled the sun, and if, in addition, the Earth stayed the same distance from the sun all year long, then clock time and sun time would always agree. However, the Earth's axis is tilted 23.45 degrees out of vertical, and our distance from the sun varies by about 5 million kilometers, 3 million miles throughout the year. At and around the equinoxes, solar days are shorter than 24 hours, and yet at the solstices, solar days are longer than 24 hours. The latest sunsets always come on or near June 27th at mid-northern latitudes every year. So here's the bottom line. Why don't the latest sunsets come on the longest or solstice day? In a nutshell, according to Bruce McClure, who writes this for EarthSky.org, it's a discrepancy between the sun and the clock. Thus, for mid-northern latitudes, the latest sunsets always come in late June. And NASA is still struggling and efforting to get those launched vapor canisters into the air and make colorful clouds. Meanwhile, here's a headline, SpaceX nails two rocket launches in one weekend. Jackie Wattles wrote this for the Money Bureau at CNN.com. Here we go. SpaceX just capped off two successful missions to space this weekend, the company's quickest launch turnaround yet. After it launched a communication satellite into orbit from Kennedy Space Center in Florida on Friday, Tesla CEO Elon Musk's private space outfit finished its run with a clean launch from California's Vandenberg Air Force Base on Sunday. The Sunday launch marked SpaceX's ninth so far this year. The company has now surpassed the record for the most launches in a single year. That record was set in 2016. The latest mission? To deliver a group of satellites into orbit for a company called Iridium. Those satellites will join a growing network dubbed the Iridium Next system. Iridium Next has many goals. One of its most notable is to eliminate black zones, where commercial airplanes can't be tracked by providing global real-time surveillance of all flights. That means missing airplanes, like the Malaysian Airlines flight that vanished three years ago over the Indian Ocean, 
could become a thing of the past. It will take several more launches to get the full network into orbit. The launch on Sunday was SpaceX's second delivery. It sent up the first 10 satellites in January. There are going to be six more Iridium Next missions over this next year. Friday's mission was also noteworthy. It marked the second time SpaceX has reused a first-stage rocket booster, which flings the payload toward orbit. The booster was previously used in a January mission. SpaceX wants to reuse its rockets so it can drastically slash the amount a single launch costs. The sticker price for a customer, $62 million. SpaceX is the only company that has recovered, refurbished, and then reflown an orbital class rocket. By completing its second mission with a used rocket, SpaceX has again signaled to its customers that it can safely pull off this maneuver. Sunday's mission didn't use a pre-flown booster, but SpaceX did manage to safely recover the first stage after that launch, setting it up to fly again one day. So far, SpaceX has safely landed first-stage rockets on land or a drone ship 13 times. Yep, that lucky 13. Hmm, this broadcaster just had a question occur to her regarding space junk. Well, that question was triggered by this next up story. We're just pondering how long it will be, if at all, before there will be a fine for littering in outer space. Hmm, just a thought. Well, here's the story from Matt Williams for universetoday.com. Headline, let's clean up the space junk with magnetic space tugs. After 50 years of sending rockets, satellites, and payloads into orbit, humanity has created something of a space junk problem. Recent estimates indicate there are more than 170 million pieces of debris up there, ranging in size from less than one centimeter, that's 0.4 inches, to a few meters in diameter. Not only does this junk threaten spacecraft and the International Space Station, but collisions between bits of debris can cause more to form. It's a phenomenon known as the Kessler effect. And thanks to the growth of the commercial aerospace industry and the development of small satellites, things are not likely to get any less cluttered up there anytime soon. Hence why multiple strategies are being explored to clean up the space lanes, ranging from robotic arms and nets to harpoons. But in what may be the most ambitious plan to date, the European Space Agency is proposing to create space tugs with powerful magnets to yank debris out of orbit. This concept comes from Emilien Fabaker. He's a researcher from the Institut Supérieur de l'Aéronautique et de l'Espace at the University of Toulouse, France. Apologies to you French speakers. His concept for a magnetic tug seeks to address one type of space debris in particular, inoperable satellites. These uncontrolled, rapidly spinning objects often weigh up to several tons and are therefore one of the most significant collision hazards there is. When applied to the problem of orbital debris, magnetic attraction is an attractive solution for the safe deorbiting of space satellites who are spent. For starters, it relies on technology that is standard issue aboard many low-orbiting satellites. It's something known as magnetorquers. That's spelled M-A-G-N-E-T-O-R-Q-U-E-R-S. These electromagnets allow satellites to adjust their orientation using the Earth's magnetic field. Hence, debris-chasing satellites wouldn't need to be specially equipped in advance. What's more, this same magnetic attraction or repulsion technology is being considered as a safe method for allowing multiple satellites to maintain close formations in space. Such satellites, for instance, NASA's Magnetospheric Multiscale Mission, the Landsat 7, and the Earth Observing 1 satellites, and the European Space Agency's upcoming LISA mission. They're either operational or soon will be around the Earth. Because of this, this kind of magnetic attraction technology presents a safe and effective alternative for deorbiting space junk.
This wonderful article does continue, and it gets rather technical, just doesn't make good radio. So we will provide a link for you gentle listeners later to peruse at your leisure. You can find this article and all the rest of the content for UFO Headline News later at ufoheadlinenews.com. Let's see if we can go from space tugs and debris in space to a tug of a different kind, a pull, a desire, a longing. Well, if you have a longing to attend a UFO fest, say, oh, Roswell, perhaps, then you're going to like this next story. It's from KRQE out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Headline, influx of people expected during this weekend's UFO fest. Allison Martinez gets the byline here, and she writes, There is one New Mexico town that brings in tourists for a very specific reason. It's the supposed alien invasion of 1947. As Roswell celebrates its UFO festival for the 70th year, the city's preparing for what's expected to be its largest event ever. Business owners on Main Street are also gearing up for this year's event. Hotels are booked up, and everyone's getting ready for this influx of people expected to invade town this weekend. Alien streetlights, alien dolls, and alien headbands. Well, that's just a few of the alien things you're going to see this weekend during UFO Fest. Said Jim Hill, an employee at the International UFO Museum, quote, I think we're going to have a big crowd this year, end quotes. The city, population 48,000, says it's expecting more than 50,000 visitors during the 70th anniversary event, which would surpass its 50th year anniversary celebration. Quote, we'll be at capacity this weekend, somewhere close to 3,000 a day, end quote. And that's also from Jim Hill. Said Jesse Payne, an employee at Alien Zone, quote, definitely some high expectations here. I've seen some really cool advertisements and posters, and they're really trying to put more of an effort towards making the festival really big this year, end quotes. And of course, with the visitors comes the revenue. In fact, many businesses say they make most of their revenue just this weekend alone. Quote, it's pretty much our Christmas every year. We survive most of our year off of the UFO festival, end quotes, said Jeff Cook, an employee at Alien Invasion. Along with all the alien gear, there will be many sharing their hypotheses on what exactly happened on July 7th, 1947. Quote, We all think that the UFO came because of the nuclear test that we set off at Trinity Test Site. End quotes. That's from Donna Mills Gore Ellis. She's a visitor to Roswell. People of all ages are already pouring into town to enjoy the alien vibes. Quote, it's really cool. There are lots of things to do involving aliens, end quotes. That's from another visitor to Roswell. And yet another visitor, Rupert Gwillen, said, quote, it's nice that someone wants to believe in that. Like, good for them, end quotes. Visitors will be coming from all over the world to invade Roswell as the festival kicks off on Thursday at noon. So many hotels are already booked for the weekend, and the city is asking local visitors to bring a camper and stay at Bottomless Lakes State Park to accommodate out-of-state visitors. Monday, city officials were out sprucing up Main Street, making final plans for the event. The temperatures in Roswell will be in the high 90s this weekend, with events taking place both indoors and outdoors. And while we're in that particular geolocation, we want to send heartfelt concerns and prayers to everybody living in the fire zones in the great southwest United States. Lots of fires, lots of people tossed out of their houses temporarily, we hope. Now, hang on, we're going to shift our trajectory and geolocation from the southwest of the United States to the east coast, roughly, Marietta, Georgia. That's the setting for MUFON sighting number 84633. The date of this sighting, June 27th, 2017, and it got a same-day report. Here's the summary. A friend and I observed a light in the sky that moved, stopped, and then moved again in a different location. Sighting specifics offer a viewing distance unknown, as is the altitude. The sighting duration, 1 hour and 30 minutes, Object features, none. Object flight path, path with directional change. 
and this object is reported to have been shaped like a star. There isn't any weather except for the notation that Marietta, Georgia was not experiencing any abnormal weather conditions at the time. Here's the account. First person, sitting outside, a couple of friends and I were talking and having cigarettes. I was observing the constellations when I noticed what looked like a star in movement. I pointed up and called it out, at which point one of my friends saw it as well. So we watched this thing for about a minute, when it came to a stop. We almost lost sight of it because of how similar to a star it was, but this thing changed direction and began moving in some manner. I can definitely... Celebrate the holiday with great savings during Lowe's Go Forth event. Make your patio a happening hangout for family and friends with up to 25% off select patio furniture and outdoor decor. And your guests are going to be hungry. So be prepared to grill with a two-pack of Kingsford charcoal now for just $9.88. All projects have a starting point. Start with Lowe's. Patio and charcoal offers valid while supplies last in U.S. only. Charcoal offer limited to two bags per customer, 628 through 75. At least say it was not a shooting star. It was too slow. It was not an airplane. There were no left and right lights, no red, green, no sound. And it wasn't a meteor. There was no tail. It was either high in the sky, meaning it was huge and moving fast, or it was closer and tiny, which I doubt very much. To be honest, this is not my first encounter. It's the fourth in this area. However, this is the second time in this location that I've had a witness. I have no pictures, but if anybody's interested, I can provide additional information. I want to know how many people have experienced this. And our witness goes on to say he would like some help with this from MUFON, and he would like to be contacted, and thanks for our time. Well, in this case, MUFON's time. And poor old MUFON, in this case, stretched to the limit volunteer-wise, like many organizations. And as we understand it, they're undergoing a bit of housekeeping within the organization itself. But still lots of fine people doing lots of fine work. And along with the folks at UFOstalker.com, they bring us articles like this. UFO sighting in Kelowna, British Columbia. It's MUFON, case number 84628. This sighting took place June 24th this year, but wasn't reported till two days later. Here's the summary. Object hovered, reflective. Another reflective object flew up, stayed in formation, then ascended. Sighting specifics categories in this case give us an unknown viewing distance. The altitude was over 500 feet, and there didn't seem to be any cloud cover at the time. The sighting duration was 20 minutes. Object features, vexingly, simply described as none. The object flight path was hovering and then path, and this object was shaped like a sphere. Several sightings in Kelowna, we hope we're pronouncing that right, Kelowna, Kelowna, it's K-E-L-O-W-N-A. It's an area of activity. So here's the account from this particular case of activity. Two of my friends and I were outside when one of them noticed a strange reflective object in the sky. We thought at first it was a silver helium balloon, but after a few minutes of observing it, we noticed it wasn't moving at all. Another similar looking object appeared then, and it flew up to the hovering one at a fairly high speed. And then the two objects hovered for a couple more minutes at that same distance from each other. Eventually, both objects started slowly ascending until they became very faint and we just could not see them. It was hard for us to judge the size and altitude of these objects, but our best guess would be over 5,000 feet. I'm not sure what they could have been. They did not look or act like helicopters or drones interesting, strangely behaving objects. It's the stopping part that we find the most strange. Very cool, more than one witness here. Let's stay north. We're still in Canada. This time we're in Collingwood, Ontario, Canada, for MUFON case number 84605. The date of this sighting is June 24th. It got a next day report. Yep, 2017 is the year. 
the summary zippy white light over Georgian Bay. Viewing distance over one mile, altitude over 500 feet and under a cloud cover, and then later over 500 feet and that cloud cover was gone. Sighting duration, 45 seconds. Object features unknown. The flight path, path with directional change at some point, and the shape of this object is simply listed as unknown. There isn't any weather, let's just jump right into it. On June 24, 2017, at approximately 10.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, myself and five other family members were out on the patio. We were stargazing. And then we noticed a very bright white light streaking across a short section of the sky. We were facing north, looking out over Georgian Bay, when we first saw this light. It came from the west. At first we all thought this was a shooting star until it blinked out and then appeared slightly to the east of where we had seen it previously. This object repeated this action another four or so times, each time heading more eastward, heading directly away from our line of sight. There was a slight zigzag when it would appear and disappear. It wasn't traveling in a perfectly straight line. It was difficult for us to tell whether this was moving slightly up or down, or perhaps left or right, because of how fast it was moving. We lost sight of this object as it was heading east towards Wasaga Beach. It was here where we did not see it come back. And overall, this entire event only lasted 45 seconds or so. The object made zero noise as it moved, and also there were no other planes or satellites in this area at the time. This object emitted a very white light, which made it difficult to make out the exact shape and size. At arm's length, this would appear to be an inch in length. I do not know if this was the size of the object or if this was the length of the streak, the after image this object was leaving behind. I've been an amateur astronomer sky watcher since I was a child. I've seen comets, meteors, satellites, the International Space Station, etc., but I am at a loss to explain what it was exactly in the sky. To us, it's always more of a mystery when somebody is hip to what's up there and knows this is not the normal thing one sees up there. Speaking of up there, we're still up there in Canada. So let's grab this story from the DurhamRegion.com. It's out of Oshawa. And here's the headline. A Shawa photographer captures unidentified flying object. Ken Rice said he's never seen anything like this, and he has no idea what it is. Parvana Pessian gets the byline here. And gentle listeners, if you haven't yet trekked on over to ufoheadlinenews.com, oh, a perfect opportunity. We have no way to really describe this photograph or the subject of the photograph specifically. It sort of resembles the bottom part of a sunflower with all the petals removed or an inflated apple pie with a tentacle. Oh, you're just going to have to see it for yourselves. Make your own deduction. To this broadcaster, it somehow looks organic. But here's the story. Wildlife photographer Ken Rice was out shooting photos on Saturday when something unusual suddenly appeared in his camera lens. Quote, it came out of nowhere, this thing, end quotes, said the Oshawa resident who was at the Marsh area near the General Motors of Canada headquarters. That's located on Colonel Sam Drive. It was about 7.45 p.m. on June 17th when Ken Rice noticed this object off in the distance. Quote, I was walking back to my car and I just saw something pop out of nowhere, way up high, far away in the sky, end quote, he said. Quote, I thought it was a big turkey vulture, so I just shot a picture of it anyway, and then it kind of hovered. It sat there for a minute and then it took off, end quotes. After returning home, Rice took a closer look at this image and he says he has no idea what this could be. Quote, a balloon wouldn't go that fast and disappear, number one, and it was too high. Nobody would have been flying a kite there. It's just railroad tracks and the road there was there was nobody around. I didn't see anybody. And where did this thing go? End quotes. 
Ken Rice has shown the photo to several people, even posted it on Facebook, but so far nobody's been able to identify it. Quote, it's just really odd. I've never seen anything like that. I looked on the internet to find weather balloons, that kind of thing, to see what it might be, but none of the photos I found look anything like this, end quotes, he said. He continued, quote, you hear people all the time with the UFO stuff, but a UFO simply stands for unidentified flying object. It doesn't mean aliens. And to me, it's an unidentified flying object. I don't know what it is, end quotes. Sad to say, gentle listeners, nor do we. Head on over, check out that photograph. But right now, we've got a Zoom because that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Inception Radio Network. Follow today's broadcast at ufoheadlinenews.com. Loving kindness, we're all in this together. This is Carol Carl. See you tomorrow. Lowe's has you covered for all those projects on your summer to-do list and will even help you save. Give your home a whole new look inside and out with 10 to $40 off paint, exterior stains, and resurfacers via rebate. And add a pop of color to your porch or patio with flowers. Get your choice two for $10 basic one and a half gallon hanging baskets. All projects have a starting point. Start with Lowe's. Paint offer valid 621 through 75. Exclusions apply. Plan offer valid 628 through 75. Color and selection vary by location while supplies last U.S. only.